Several years ago, I spent an afternoon with my good friend Dave Bendixson, and he and I were shooting muzzle loaders and getting ready for the upcoming hunting season, and we were talking about hunting and, and archery and just our love of the great outdoors. And, and I mentioned to Dave, I said, you know, hey Dave, I recently took up fly fishing, and I said, and it is a blast. You would absolutely love it. Man, you need to you need to come with me sometime and go fly fishing. And I remember he looked at me and he said, no. I mean, just really blunt like that, almost kind of rude. And if you ever knew Dave, being a little Norwegian, he could kind of say some things a little brusque. And, but then he explained and he said, if I take up one more hobby, Marty will kill me. <laughs> Marty was his wife, by the way. And, and I, and I did understand then, because, you know, we can get so many things going on in our life that before long we're not really taking care of the important things in our lives. We have a tendency to prioritize things, and we can sometimes get those priorities mixed up a little bit. Again, several years ago, Mark and Jan Toomey invited Dory and I out on their sailboat one time, and I really wanted to go because I, I, I've never been on a sailboat, and I thought that would be really cool. And so when he came and approached me about it, I said, well, let me check my calendar, and I'll get back to you when I find a time that works. Well, the end of boating season came and went, and I remember going to Mark afterwards and telling him, you know, man, I'm really sorry that, that it just never worked out. We just never really, I never really had the time. And I'll never forget what Mark said, because it stuck with me kind of like what Dave said that stuck with me. Mark said, no, you didn't make the time. And it, and it was exactly right. He goes, oh, I'm sorry. Well, you got it just right. We didn't either. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it comes down to when we prioritize things, that's what we give our time to. We'll make time for the things that are important to us, right? the things that we want to do, those things that aren't quite so high on our priority list, we don't make the time for those. And so a lot of times we can determine somebody's priorities based upon where their time is spent, right? And it's very easy uh, for us to get our priorities and our allotments of time mixed up. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at what Jesus says about our priorities in Mark or in Luke chapter 9. And so I, I want you to turn there with me. Luke chapter 9, we're going to pick up in verse 18. In Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 18. It's on page 733 if you're using the Bible. In verse 18... Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others uh, that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. You know, Jesus has just asked them the most important and the most important question. And Peter answers, and he answers it correctly, because Jesus doesn't correct him. In verse 21, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. They ask, he asks them the important question, and, and they answer correctly, Jesus is the Christ. We don't know exactly what their understanding of the Messiah was. The Messiah would probably be a better translation than the Christ. By the time Luke wrote, Christ had kind of become Jesus' name, but, but his answer is, you are the Messiah of God in Hebrew, but we don't really understand what their view of the Messiah was. There were several that were out there at that time, but I can probably guarantee you that their expectation of the Messiah did not include suffering, did not include death. <clears throat> and so this was pretty 
interesting for them. Jesus lays out the order in which things are going to have to take place. There's going to be suffering, there's going to be death, and then he will be raised to life. Suffering, then death, and then life in that order. Most of us, when we prioritize our life, when we lay out the order of our life and put the things in order of importance, we don't order them suffering and then death and then life as if those are our first priorities. In fact, most of us, we order our life so that it begins with comfort. Having the things that make me comfortable and make my life easy and make my life smooth and makes me feel good about who I am and how I am. Think about how many hours of your life are spent in order to obtain things that make you more comfortable. Make your life more easy. Make things less of a struggle for you. That's kind of how we begin prioritizing our life. And then instead of death becoming one of the priorities in our life, we do everything we can to avoid it. With all of the vitamins that we take and the diets that we go on and all of the things, and doctor's appointments. and How many hours, how much time do we spend making sure that we keep this life, the life that we have, the life we've built, not just the physical life, but everything in our life, our career and our reputation and all of those things. And then after we've gotten all of that, after we've earned all of our money and we've got our nice house, we've got all of the things that make us comfortable and we're good with life, then we'll focus on the afterlife and death and the things that come <coughs> after that. But Jesus kind of reminds us that this is the wrong way to look at things. Pick up reading with me again in verse 23. Then Jesus said to them, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. Now notice uh, up in verse 22, Jesus said the Son of Man must suffer and he must be killed. And in our class on Hebrews, when we were looking this morning at, you know, Jesus had to die. You and I could not be saved unless he died. He must die, he says. And then he goes on to tell his disciples that anyone who, must, who would come after me must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will, will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of his holy angels. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. You see, there isn't an option to these things. These are things that must be done, must deny himself, must take up his cross daily and follow me. And we'll talk more about those when we get to them in just a minute. But before we move on, Jesus needs to make sure that his disciples understand Jesus is not just any other rabbi. You see, a lot of the Jewish people men followed rabbis and they learned from these Jews their interpretation of the scriptures and how they were to live their life and everything. But these rabbi or these disciples need to understand that Jesus is not just some random uh, rabbi who's going around and teaching. They need to understand that he is more than that. And so in verse 28, about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and they went up onto a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, his, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was, he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy and when they became fully awake, they saw his glory 
and the two men standing with him. And as the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. And he did not know what he was saying. And while he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and they were afraid, and they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my Son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice spoke and they found that Jesus was alone, the disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. Listen to him is what God says. Jesus had just said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. And God says, guys, listen to him. Do what he says. It's time to stop thinking like the world where comfort and security are the top priority. And it's time to begin walking in the way of the Messiah. A way that leads to suffering. In a way that leads to death to self. But is also the only way to truly find life. And even with his all of his power, Jesus has to walk that path of suffering. Picking up in verse 37. The next day when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. The Spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions, so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely leaves him, and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive him out, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even when the boy was, while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the evil spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. So here's Jesus' disciples. They can't drive out the spirit. They don't have the power to do it. Jesus is all-powerful, almighty. God has just said, this is my son whom I love, the one I've chosen. Listen to him. Everything. Jesus has everything. Amen? I mean, he's awesome, right? And then he says, while everyone was marveling at this, Jesus said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. And remember, God has just told the disciples, listen to me. And Jesus said, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. See, this path, with all of its glory, with all of its power, with all of everything, this path leads to death. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. The way of the Messiah is a way of suffering. It is a way of death to self. Verse 45, but they did not understand what he meant by this. It was hidden from them. So they did not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. And we see that they didn't get it. Because right after this, when it's all about death to self, right after this we have these stories of these guys arguing about who's going to be the greatest. Picking up in verse 46, an argument started among the disciples as to which one of them would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. And he said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For he who is least among you all, he is the greatest. They were all about themselves. It's all about me. It's all about who of us is the greatest and who of us is the best and who of us has the more power and the more authority and the more everything. And Jesus brings this little kid. Little kids, it's not that the kid was innocent, just accepted everything. It was the fact that kids were really kind of nobodies in society. They didn't have any power. They didn't have any status. They didn't have any reputation. Kids were to be seen and not heard. And seen as little as possible, kind of. They just had no status. And Jesus says, guys, this is it. You really want to be great? 
then you say no to yourself, you deny yourself, you suffer for other people, you become the least. Then you'll be the greatest. They didn't get it still. Because right after that, verse 49, Master, they said, or said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he's not one of us. In other words, after all, we are the ones. We're better than everybody else because we got you, Jesus. We're your disciples. Look at us. Woo! Aren't we something? And that's still their mindset. And Jesus says to them, don't stop it, guys. For whoever is not against you is for you. At that same time, or as the time approached for him to be taken up into heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem and he sent messengers on ahead and they went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? In other words, if they're not going to treat you good and you are something absolutely awesome and great and powerful, then we need to put them in their place. We need to just wipe them out. Because they don't go, they're not going along with, with us. Jesus rebukes them. He turned and rebuked them and they went to another village. You see, they just never quite <coughs> got it. Every time they turned around, they were, they were thinking in a worldly way. And so, Jesus comes through with some more blunt teachings beginning in verse 57. And as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. How many of you have ever said, you know, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. I want to, I'm a wholehearted, fully committed disciple of Jesus Christ. I'll go wherever you send me. How many of you have ever said that? which is what we're supposed to do when we rise up out of the waters of baptism, when we have this new life, that's the pledge we're really supposed to be making. That's what this man says to Jesus. And in verse 58, Jesus replied, You know, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. Son of man has no place to lay his head. There's no place as the Son of Man, as the Messiah, that He was actually safe and comfortable. People were always out to get Him. When you decide to make Jesus your Lord and your Savior, and you decide to walk on His way, you really give up the rights to even the most basic comforts of a pillow and a place to lay your head. That's what it means to have your priorities straight. Following Him is more important than any of those other comforts in life. And then in verse 59, He said to another man, Jesus did follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Now, there have been all kinds of lessons and sermons and books written to explain what that really meant there because in the Jewish mindset, the burial of a loved one was one of the most sacred things that you could do for someone. And there have been a lot of people that said, you know, surely Jesus wouldn't have denied them that responsibility and that right because that's what they were supposed to be doing. And we try to soften what Jesus is saying here. But you remember other places Jesus has said, unless a man hates his father and mother, he cannot be my disciple. Now you can say, well, well Lance, that's all hyperbole. Maybe it is. But if it is, Jesus is using that hyperbole for a point. And the point is that he is more important than any other person, living or deceased, in this world. He is the main priority. The kingdom is the main priority. And he kind of gets into that next. Uh, man says, let me bury my father. Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. For, for, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And still another man said, 
I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus said, no one who put his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Again, one of those places where a lot of people say, you know, what is Jesus really saying there? I mean, is, he, is it hyperbole? I mean, you know, you got you kind of look back. You always kind of look back at what you had before. And Jesus is saying, guys, you can't look back. Once you step onto this path, there is no turning back for you. And in fact, I think, I think this is a neat illustration. If you flip back with me to uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, it's on page 255 in the Pew Bible. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19. Great example of someone who's called by God, who turns back to the plow. But it, it's such a cool little story. Chapter 19, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19. So Elijah went from there and he found Elisha, son of Shaphat. Shaphat, excuse me. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen and himself, he himself was driving the 12th pair. And Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak <coughs> around him. Elisha left his, then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Now here, Elisha has said, I'm going to come and I'm going to follow Elijah. And Elijah says, go back. What have I done to you? And this evidently got Elisha thinking, you know, realizing, hey, I've been called to something here. And so he does go back, but notice he doesn't go back and say goodbye and kiss his father and mother goodbye. It says, in verse 21, so Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and he slaughtered them. And he burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and he gave it to the people and they ate. And then he set out to follow Elijah and he became his attendant. He slaughtered his oxen and he burned his plows. There is no going back. And, and that is what Jesus is saying. When we make Him our Lord and Savior, when He is our Messiah, when we begin walking down that path, there is no turning back. There is no going back to this world. We now belong to Him. In fact, turn back again with me now to verse 23. And let's look at that again. Jesus said to them, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. That deny himself means to say no to self. All of the things in our life that we say, you know, man, I'd love to do this. We were talking about it in our class this morning. You know, I'd love to do this. I know it may not be exactly what God wants me to do, but man, I want to do it so bad, and I know he'll forgive me. And so we do it anyway. And Jesus says, unless you deny yourself, say no to yourself. And take up our cross daily. The cross was a thing of suffering. It was a symbol of death. It wasn't a little necklace or a bumper sticker. It was something that when you took up your cross, you were suffering on the road to death. That was the outcome of it. Jesus says that we must deny ourselves. We must take up our cross daily. We must lose our life. Jesus suffered, died, and then lived. And guys, that's what we're called to do as well. We are to suffer by denying ourselves all the things that we want to do. We are to die to self. Because only then do we really find out and really experience what life is. If our life is just about going to work every day, because i got to go to work every day so I can afford a nice house, so I can afford a nice car, so I can afford to get my kids through college, so I can afford all this, I can afford all that, I can afford all of this, then our life, our, our job requires all of our time, 
which means that it's the number one priority. And a lot of times when we start prioritizing that way, then church and kingdom business is just what we do in the leftovers. And how many times have, have any of us ever said, you know, uh, yeah, this is going on, but I don't have time to do it. Have any of you ever said those words? I'd love to do that, but I just don't have time. And how often is it that there's church stuff going on that we say, man, I'd kind of like to do that, but I just don't have time. And the question is, do we not have time or are we not making time? And you see what our attitude and the way we think really ought to be is, all my life is to, live, is to be lived for the kingdom of God. Every moment that I am awake, I want to serve Christ. I want to walk in His footsteps. I want to be about Him and about His business. And, and then our job is just something that gets in the way of our ministry. It's a necessary get in the way sometimes, but it's still our priority is the kingdom. That's where our time goes. That's where our life is. You know, the New Year's coming up. A lot of times people make New Year's resolutions or set new goals or, or do whatever. I want you this week, the next couple of weeks, to really start looking at your life and where your priorities are. What is most important to you? And are you making time for what really should be the most important? Now I gotta tell you, I don't I I don't like this sermon. Somebody said uh, something about you know being encouraged by Lance's words, and I'm thinking uh, Lance is encouraged by Lance's words this morning. You know why? I got a lot of stuff I like to do. Good another good friend of mine a few years ago, Carl Roberts. Uh, he and I were talking one day. And I asked him, I said, I said, Carl, what are your hobbies? I said, do you play golf? And he said, no, nope, don't have time for it. I said, do you hunt? No, nope, don't have time for it. Said, what do you do? And he said, I save lost people. And he said, and because that is a full-time job, I don't have time to do anything else. And I've never taken up any other hobbies because they would interfere with the time God has called me to be saved and lost people. I was going through the other day looking in my man cave, which is looks kind of like a cave right now, and looking at all of the stuff I've got for all of my hobbies. And I think this year it's time to be changing some stuff. Time to do some weeding some of the things that are hindering my kingdom time. And I challenge you to look at your life in the coming weeks as well. See if it's time you need to be doing some changes also. Maybe this morning you need to make some changes. Maybe you, you realize that you've not made the commitment you need to and you want to do that. We always end our services with what we call an invitation song or a song of encouragement. It's just a time for you to let us know what we can be doing as a church to help you in any way. Uh, we can help you die. We can. Hey, we got a we've got a grave right up here behind this wall. It's a it's a watery grave. It's our baptismal, and, and truly. You know, what God calls us to do is to die to self and be raised to new life in Him. Maybe you've never done that. The reality is, if you never have, then you will never experience true life. You'll never experience eternal life. Maybe that's what you need to do this morning. Whatever need you may have, Chuck's going to lead us in this song. We'll all stand to sing it. And if you need something, please come down to the front. We'll help you any way we can. Let's stand.